How do you reinvent yourself? Are you sick of who you are? <laughs> do you want to be someone better? Do you want to achieve more? Do you want better relationships? Do you want a better business? Do you want to get out of the grind? Do you want to just go, you know what? I've had enough. I need a change. How do you reinvent yourself? And maybe not just one time in your life. Maybe you, you do it every day or every week or every year. Well, today we're going to figure out seven ways to reinvent yourself. And to help you figure that out, I've brought in an entrepreneur from the UK by the name of Peter Sage. He's built multiple companies and he joins us right now from Leicester in England. And of course, he's celebrating the, the Leicester Football Club winning the Premier League title, the English Soccer Championship recently. Peter Sage, how are you, sir? I'm absolutely fabulous. Thank you, James. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you here. Now, you're a pretty impressive man. I was looking at your bio and I've seen here that you've shared the stage with uh, the former US President Bill Clinton, Sir Richard Branson. You've built multiple companies. You have a, a, an Amazon number one best-selling book uh, called The Five Keys to Master Life. You're an underachiever, are you? Uh, yeah, serial underachiever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll get into some of the patterns around that earlier, but I've, I have, have been very blessed to you know, I've had um, a lot of lessons and a lot of paths in life that have allowed me to learn from you know, some of the, the, the best people in the world of what they do. And I think that's what all of us strive for at some level. And I bet you've also had some failures as well along the way. Oh, spectacular failures. Uh, and, and some that I've, you know, I look back and celebrate with uh, full enthusiasm as being far better teachers than, than success, which you know, really breeds complacency. Uh, yes. But fa failures are your, your pencil sharpener of life. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to be talking about seven ways to, to reinvent yourself, but just give us a little background on you. Like, what's your story? Where did you grow up? How did you get to, to be here? And, and, and how have you, I guess, reinvented yourself over the years? Um, great question. Thank you. I mean, I'm first of all, and I'll, I'll say this openly to any uh, of the viewers or, or listeners here, and that is that, you know, regardless of background, bio and story, I'm just a normal guy. I'm exactly the same as anybody else sitting in their, their chair or car listening to this. And yeah, I've, you know, we've all got a path, we've all got a story. And mine started you know, 44 years ago. I was born on a council estate, sort of low cost housing estate in England, to kind of working to middle class parents. And yeah, I, I always knew that there was more to life than the traditionally conditioned society pathway of go to school, get good grades, go to college, you know, get a job and uh, all of the traditional stuff we were sold on in the typical 20th century that now most people realize it doesn't have a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And yeah, I, I always had a thirst for wanting to, to, to know that there's more, a bit like Neo in the Matrix, you know, there's a splinter in your mind, right. Right. Not, something not quite right with the model that we're being shown. Uh, and I'm very blessed if, if I can put my, my path down to anything, it was that level of impetus, which I do believe all of us have at some point. But you know, whether we listen to you know, that, that sort of you know, hand of fate knocking on the door of our soul or not is really down to you know, personal preference and, and our journey at the time. So I dropped out of school at 16. You know, I've got no formal qualifications. You know, I never suffered the disadvantage of college. Yeah, and, <laughs> I like yeah, how you I, put that there, the disadvantage of college. Yeah, very clever. Well, I uh, and started my first company at 17, which was essentially a startup where I started selling toys on flea markets and car boot sales, as we call them in England, and, and really just trying to make my way in the world and understand the lessons that I was learning at the time as best I could. And uh, the many, many different lessons out of that. I mean, since then, there's been 22, 23 companies, you know, all startups, all in different industries. Some have failed spectacularly, as, as I mentioned. Some have wiped me out completely. Some have been great. Some have been multi-million dollar successes. Some have been global brands. And you know, some should have stayed ideas when I was in the bar. <laughs> yeah. And everything in between. And, and that journey itself has really been inspiring to me because you know, life is all about the, you know, the primary pattern, which if you go to physics at any level will tell you it's the wave. You know, everything resonates, everything vibrates at some level and vibrations are based and measured in hertz. And frequency is measured in hertz. It's an up and a down. So rather than live in this narrow little tiny bandwidth we try to design ourselves in, which is essentially a flat line of life, you know, why not you know, go and really climb the peaks and fall in the troughs and, and swing the bat at that level? That's really been my journey. And it sounds like uh, 
you know, you said 22 or 23 startup companies. It sounds like when you're saying reinventing yourself, it, it's uh, under the guise of, uh, of a business or starting new businesses. Um, does that change your personality over, you know, when you start a new company or you switch companies or have you changed in terms of how you view the world or in relationships? I don't want to just um, focus on reinventing yourself in terms of building a business, but reinventing yourself on a spiritual level, maybe, or reinventing yourself by moving to another country, another city. Like what are the other ways besides building companies? Have you, do you feel like you've reinvented yourself over the years? Well, great question, James. And the reason I say it is because it isn't about the business. The business is an expression of the business owner. Mm. Now, most business owners are looking to improve their skill set. Uh, they're looking to learn the next thing. They're looking to start up another division or, or idea or whatever it may be. Uh, and here's what I've known. And I've coached business owners now at you know, high level for many, many years. Mm. And it, a lot of them come to me because you know, they want business coaching. Mm. And every, every single time, I guarantee you, it is not the business that's the issue. It is the business owner that is the issue because right. your business is an expression of the projection of who you are. Right. Your patterns, your beliefs, your insecurities, your, your unconscious behaviors, your model of the world, that manifests in what you choose as a vehicle that we call business. So changing the business without reinventing who you are is futile. You'll simply learn new skills and new ways and new opportunities of earning the same amount of money. Right. Yeah, unless you change who you are. And that's where reinvention is so powerful. You cannot reinvent a business without reinventing the person who is leading that business. Right. That all over the place, whether it's Steve Jobs or whether it's you know, yeah, uh, many of the other icons throughout history. Yes. And so who you are comes first. The business is an expression of that. So if you don't figure out your own game, then I don't care how many marketing seminars you go to. You know, I get approached as an example, yeah, just to peel back the onion here to give people a concrete mm -hmm. example. Let's say a business owner comes to me and says, oh, I need time management. And most business coaches will say, okay, let's focus on time management because yeah, the, my schedule's so busy and crazy. I'm so overwhelmed. I need to manage my time better. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you don't. You can't manage time. You can only manage yourself in relationship to time. Right. And the problem at that level is yeah, under further investigation, one possible and quite common aspect is that they're so fearful of letting go of the need for control that they're micromanaging everything and therefore taking too much on their plate. Therefore, the illusion is they need time management where well, that's not the issue. Right. Or they're petrified of rejection. Yeah, they don't say no to somebody because they've got an issue with rejection. Therefore, they say yes too often. And therefore, you know, they get too much on their plate and therefore they think they need time management. So without addressing the fundamental psychology behind what's causing the issues in the outer world yeah, and reinventing yourself, it doesn't matter what you do you know, at that point on. You, you already got the foot in the wrong corridor. Right. It's such a mental game. Everything to do with life. I was just walking on Sunset Boulevard last, last night with a good friend of mine, a, a fellow Brit, a guy called Mark Dahmer, uh, who's a, a personal trainer out here in Hollywood and a health expert. And we were talking about how everything in life is just controlling or managing our mind, you know, how we perceive the world, how we react, uh, and uh, it's, inc it's incredible. Like I, I've learned a whole lot of skills to do with business, which have helped me grow my businesses. But I'm telling you, like as soon as you can, I don't think we're ever going to master our mind. At least I don't feel like we can. But as soon as you can, can control it to the best, the best way that you can, it's amazing how all of those specific skills in business, you can really utilize those uh, properly. Um, when you're like, depressed or pissed off or you're not congruent with the business that you're in, you make decisions that harm your business. As soon as I started creating businesses for me personally, where I was like, this feels right. I like this. For example, I'm the creator of the 30 day no alcohol challenge. I teach people how to quit alcohol for 30 days. I help people. People thank me for helping them. That feels good. That feels congruent. I've created these blue light blocking glasses, which help people sleep. People who've got sleep problems come to me that wear them. They say, wow, thank you so much. My sleep has improved. That feels congruent with me because I love health. But I'll tell you this, when I did a business, I was in Colombia three or four years ago and I was doing an online business with some friends of mine. There was just something about it that didn't quite feel right or congruent. And guess what? The business didn't do very well. And, and, and it ended up, ended up closing that business. So, it's so much of a mental game, isn't it, Peter? Like it's it just, it's control your mind or at least manage your mind. And then you can really, I guess, blossom or flow or, or, or really um, surge ahead. 
Well, let, let me help sum it up for, for the people listening and watching here in the shortest amount of words I can, I can do it. Yeah, and there's many levels of awareness behind what I'm about to say. Some people will intellectualize it and dismiss it. Some people, it'll strike a chord. It's wherever you are on your journey. But no matter how you, know, you want to slice and dice it, yeah, outer world follows inner world. Case right. closed. Right. right. You've got chaos in the outer world, check your thinking. Right. Uh, you've got distractions in the outer check your thinking. Right, stuff not going according to you know, your pictures as to how you think it should go. Who voted on those pictures in the first place? That's an inner world game. Right. The stress is nothing more than a byproduct of the outer world not fitting the pictures that you voted on inside as to how you think it should look. Game over. Right. Now, the very definition of stress is friction. If you go to physics, it's two things going in opposite directions with different agendas that are not in flow. Right. So therefore, if and the same two things every time. Yeah, your inner world projections of what you think the outer world should be and the actuality of that outer world. We're talking to Peter Sage, who's joining us from Leicester in the UK, in England. You can find him on Twitter at PeterSage007. Make sure you send him a tweet uh, at any point during uh, this, this interview to let him know what you liked. Make sure you put me in there, at James Swanick as well. Uh, Peter Sage is a, uh, an entrepreneur. He's built multiple companies. And now we're going to get into the seven ways to reinvent yourself, Peter. So let's get into it. What's number one? <laughs> I would say the primary first way to really start making a difference and a shift is to get out of what I call swimming in goop. Most people spend their entire life swimming in goop, G-O-O-P, the good opinion of other people. Mm. And as long as you're trapped by the good opinion of other people, you can never be authentic. Yeah, everyone talks about authenticity, but everyone's trying to be authentic. Well, by very definition, you can't try to be authentic. Authenticity is simply the absence of inauthenticity. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, yeah, how do I yeah, turn on the light? Well, no, light is simply the absence of darkness. Right. Darkness is the absence of light. You, you can't go and yeah, try to do something when your natural state is authentic. Right. Yeah, you don't get a, a pet dog that tries to play mind games yeah, and hidden agendas unless they've been around humans too long. So yeah, we become this giant chameleon, this adaptation machine, constantly modifying and filtering our behavior, yeah, mainly unconsciously through, will this person like me, approve of me, yeah, um, yeah, get on with me, do what it is that I want to fit my outer world pictures, and if not, I'm modifying my behavior. Right. Yeah, that's where politics these days falls down so hard because yeah. it's no longer statesmanship. Statesmanship is I will stand up and be authentic and be willing to be unpopular even for what I believe serves the long-term greater good. So now, when, you, when you say get out of you know, the, the good opinion of other people, mm -hmm. um, there's two sides to that I, I feel based on what you're saying. One is I, I think you seem to be saying is to do what you want to do, like know what you want to do and then just do it and to hell what, what anyone else thinks. And then there's the other side, which is, well, actually, I'm, I'm not very well skilled in a certain thing. I'm going to get a coach or a mentor or someone to give me their advice and kind of show me the way. So how do you balance those two things, which is I'm just going to do whatever I do. My opinion counts most versus I actually respect and want the opinion of other people. But then maybe you allow yourself to be, to be uh, too overly influenced by that. So what I think you're discussing here is the difference between advice and opinion. Yeah, if I need a, a skill set or if I go and uh, actively seek out somebody's advice because they have something to bring to the table that I want to model to enhance my level of authentic self and journey, then that's different. But if I'm coming from a fear-based reactive model or a preemptive fear-based model of I'm going to do or not do something based upon whether I think you like it or not, that's a very different game. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the game, unfortunately, most people play. They run around yeah, hoping to try to get love, uh, you know, approval, significance, acceptance, all of the stuff that you know, people crave, but you know, don't realize that we can only get it from ourselves. Right. So you know, there's a way to get out of the good opinion of others, and I'll share it very simply in a metaphor, because again, if people really understand what I'm about to share, it can be life-changing in a heartbeat if you allow the awareness in. One of the challenges, with the, uh, unfortunately, with the awareness is the cost of awareness is responsibility, which is why most people 
go to a surface level of, of you know, intellectualizing the awareness, it process it, and then discard it because to own it emotionally or as part of who you are would impose on them a new set of behaviors that they previously voted on as uncomfortable, otherwise they'd be doing it already. So if you can understand that you know, everybody stars in this, as the central role in the movie called Their Life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are the central character in the movie of Our Life. Mm-hmm. Now, as we go through the movie of our life, we're going to interact with other actors and actresses in that movie. By very definition, at best, they're going to be a supporting cast, yeah? a spouse, yeah, a sibling or whatever. 99% of people that enter your movie are film extras. Case closed. Now, here's the problem. The problem is we think because we come from the perspective of the star in our own movie, we think everybody else sees us as the star in our movie. Mm. Whereas the reality is they're starring in their own movie called Their Life as the star. Therefore, by definition, we can only ever be at best a supporting cast, but 99% of the time we're a film action. So we're modifying our behavior constantly, wondering what other people think of us judging us as a star in our movie. Well, guess what? Yeah, I'm going to sum this up. And usually I say this two hours into one of my workshops yeah, when we really drill down. But you know, I, yeah, your profile is you've got people that are attracted to this yeah, uh, podcast because they're forward thinking, they're entrepreneurial. So I'm going to drop this on you guys right now. Yeah? Understand that most people in life, 99% of people in life, don't care enough about you to bother to give an opinion because they're too busy being worried about what they think you're thinking of them. Absolutely. 100% true. Yeah. No one cares about you. They only care about themselves. <laughs> yeah, and it's not, it's not in a, a, a like, I don't give a crap. No, no I know. I know. It's from a, a fear-based reactive model that they're playing the same game. I, I know. There's a, there's a funny phrase. Like, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. People, <laughs> it's funny. It's like, people are like, I want people to be talking about me and thinking about me, but no one really is. <laughs> no, of course not. Yeah. Oh, I wonder what they think of my shirt. Right? I've got no issue. They don't care. They're too busy worrying about what they th- you think of their pants. I mean, it's, it's a game and we walk around in this bubble, not really understanding the reality of what's going on and living our life in this protective cocoon of reactive behavior, caring about, oh, please, I, as, as a begging bowl of, of for like approval, significance, acceptance, and all the stuff that you know, we, we grew up thinking that we didn't get. Yeah. Amazing. All right. So get out of the swimming, get out of swimming in goop, which is the good opinion of other people. Stop being reactive and just accept that people aren't really, don't, people don't really don't care for the most part. I mean, look, your mother cares, your, your family cares, all those kind of things, obviously. But for the most part, every human being on the planet is thinking about themselves first and foremost. Everybody's running the same patterns. And yeah, some of them are genetically obliged to care more than others. Yeah, exactly. However, you know, you also got to understand yeah, that yeah, if, yeah, it's not about um, not caring as such because that comes down to what your, your values are. Right. Now, I care if I hurt somebody else or somebody else is less than because they cross my path. And if I've got blind spots there, somebody hold up a mirror, I'm happy to look. But I'm not modifying my behavior in case I accidentally offend someone or I'm trying to win their approval because they ain't got time. They're trying to win mine and everybody else's. Yeah. All right. Great. So that's uh, the first way of seven. We're going to move it along here. What's the second point in the seven ways to reinvent yourself with Peter Sage? Stop making it about you. Yeah. You know, so many people are chasing business success. They're chasing, you know, the next million, they're chasing the Ferrari, they're chasing whatever it is that they're validating themselves that they'll think they'll make it relax, get happiness, chasing significance, acceptance, again, approval, the same old usual suspects. And you know, when I get there, then I will fill in the blank, be happy, have made it, relax, you know, prove to the world. And most of them are so egocentric. Most people start businesses based on an egocentric perspective. Oh, I'm going to start an online business in Columbia so that I can do well. Rather than, you know, something, I'm going to invent something or create a service that benefits so many other people and boom, you become more successful and you feel more fulfilled. And so if you understand that nature operates on two primary principles, now, I didn't make them up. You look out of your window, you'll, you'll check it out. Yeah, and that's growth and contribution. Everything in nature grows and contributes beyond itself or it's taken out of the food chain. You know, animals don't die of old age in nature. When they can no longer contribute, they contribute themselves to lunch. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's an organizing principle here and we think we're different. And when we grow up emotionally, yeah, which is a choice, 
And biologically, we don't get to choose. Emotionally, spiritually, that's the choice. And most people don't choose that because they're too busy swimming in goop. Right. So if you can understand that most stress, as I said earlier, is about outer world not following inner world's uh, pictures. But 99% of that can be cured when you stop focusing on yourself. 99% of depression can be solved when you stop focusing on you and your pity pot and your story uh, and your issues. And yeah, stops- they've, actually, they've actually done studies that show you can take a, someone who's, who says they're depressed or feels depressed. And the, the moment you take that person and you go and encourage them to help someone else less fortunate than them, their depression subsides. Yeah. So the way out of depression is to have someone is to go and help other people. And the reason why that works, uh, presumably, is because they stop focusing about themselves. Now, I would say that delicately because, you know, there, there, maybe there are people who have got severe depression and clinical depression. I'm not, well, I'm not versed enough in it uh, sufficiently to be able to pass judgment on that. But studies have shown that if you go and help someone else, i.e., as Peter is saying, stop making it about you, your depression subsides and you actually start to generate dopamine and serotonin and, and feelings of, of, of wellness. So um, it's true about growing as well, Peter. Um, you know, everything in life, like the plants, the flowers, the trees, if you don't water them and they're not growing, they're dying. And humans are the same. Like if you're not growing or if we're not growing, then we're not dying. Like we'll always have food, water, shelter, knock on wood. But spiritually, a little piece of us is dying every day. Um, and Tony Robbins, the motivational coach, says, you know, growth uh, and progress equals happiness. That's, that's the bottom line of, for human beings. You know, growth, progress equals happiness. Yeah. And yeah, it's, I've worked closely with Tony for 15 years. And yeah, I understand a lot of where he's coming from there. And let's just revisit the depression side, because again, this is not being you know, dismissive of people that have attached their identity to something else we're going to talk about uh, to, to their issue. But it's, it's the rumble strip of life. You know, if you're going down the freeway and you veer off center, you're going to hit the rumble strip. And most people complain the fact that they can't hear the music on the radio, so they're going to turn the music up. Yeah, and, and take an antidepressant. Well, no, the, the rumble strip's there to tell you you're off track. If you're focused on yourself too much, you're going to get depressed. It's nature's feedback mechanism. Say, hey, dude, wake up. Yeah, stop focusing on who you are because that's not growth and contribution. That's not why you're here. Start going out and being able to serve. And guess what? The rumble strip noise goes away as you steer closer into the center of the freeway. Right. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's, it's basically. Yeah, I'll tell you a little tip I do, Peter, as well, just on that, we're talking about depression or neg- negative thinking. Um, there are many mornings where I wake up in my bed uh, here in Los Angeles, and the first thoughts that come into my mind are negative ones. And for about two minutes, sometimes I sit there and I beat myself up naturally. And I go, you're not successful enough. You don't have uh, a wife or kids. You're 40. You're uh, still kind of like figuring things out you're not not sure where you're going to be in a year from now uh your business isn't as as successful as you want and i catch myself like i i feel it i can't help feeling it but i do i do have the skills now where i catch myself saying (laughs) and the best way that i found for me to get out of that and i've said this before on the show is to uh start reminding myself about things that I'm grateful for. And the actual, the action that I take is I go to this thing called the five minute journal. It's a book that I have and I open it up and it says, what are three things you're grateful for? And I just write in it. And it literally, it takes me between one and two minutes. That's it. I don't, I have, I can't sit still. I don't like sitting down for like 30 minutes to 60 minutes to meditate. Although I can sit, I do sit down regularly and meditate for, you know, five or 10 minutes. But just that simple act of writing down three things that I'm grateful for gets me out of my head of like, I'm not this, I'm not enough and into one of gratitude. And all of a sudden, I wouldn't actually, not all of a sudden, but gradually I come out of that mindset and then I start my day and then I'm like making things happen again and I'm, I'm feeling considerably better. That's what has worked for me. Beautiful. And it leads us into point number three on, on reinvention because yeah, if I see such a, a downside to traditional society and what keeps most people stuck, it you know, relates to my next point, which is upgrade your environment. <clears throat> now, when I say upgrade your environment, I don't mean buy a bigger house. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, there's two parts to your environment. Yeah, or the two most significant influences on, that govern your environment. And this relates to what I call the 95% law, which is the law of conformity. Yeah, you have a body that is designed by evolution and biology to adapt to its environment 24-7. That's what it will do. Now, we know that. If you put that environment or the body in the environment of McDonald's or you put it in the environment of the gym, it's going to adapt. It doesn't care which is which. It's going to adapt accordingly. But our mind is exactly the same. And our mind is a 24-7 adaptation machine to its environment. And if you could imagine that you, you, your mind is like a compass needle. It can only point in one direction at a time. And even women with that incredible diffuse sense of awareness, you know, it's like their compass needle pointing in lots of different directions quickly, but mm -hmm. it still can only point in one direction at a time. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to, again, back to laws of magnetism, how do you magnetize a compass needle? You stroke it with another magnet in one consistent direction. So which yeah, is your default north? Because if you're waking up and you are, your compass needle is pointing more negative than more positive, it's because it's had more conditioning, if you like, to yeah, a negative environment than a positive environment because it's default. Most people are walking around, sleeping awake, yeah, dry, you know, driving unconscious and you know, all the other stuff we know. So where is that compass needle? Upgrade your environment. And the two key things that are the biggest conditioners of that, that compass needle direction, one is the people that you hang with, your peer group. Yeah, love your family, choose your friends. Yeah. Yeah. If you're hanging around with 10 you know, self-motivated, yeah, how we can, not why we can't, entrepreneurial, get it done kind of people, you're going to become the 11th. That's the law of conformity. If you're hanging around with 10, you know, recreational drug users that, you know, watch daytime TV and visit Domino's Pizza every night, you're going to become the 11th. It's the law of conformity. Yeah. Right? And it's hard to break that. So check your environment. Yeah. Now, Check your environment is huge or upgrade your environment. Someone upgrade actually, as an example, someone actually pointed out to me the other, uh, last week, I've been living in, uh, in either Hollywood or West Hollywood for the better part of a decade. Um, I, I went and lived in Columbia and New York for a little bit, but Hollywood and West Hollywood in Los Angeles is a very single kind of minded uh, uh, areas of, of, of Los Angeles. Not many families, uh, single people, transient people coming in, coming out. And I've lived there and I walk around, you know, the streets and I walk to the gym and I, and I, I see a lot of people walking dogs, but I don't see a lot of couples pushing prams. Mm. And someone pointed this out to me the other day. And I was like, all of a sudden it hit me. It's like, holy hell, here I am thinking about, I want to take the next phase of my life, which is, you know, have children, potentially get married. And my environment is anything but married, happily married uh, couples with children. And mm. then I was thinking about it, it's like, well, how many happily, couple, couple, uh, happily married couples with babies do I associate with? And then I thought, hardly any. Mm. I mean, I know some, but I don't spend a lot of time with them. And so if I'm always hanging out with single people where marriage and kids is not uh, a priority, then chances are I'm always going to be having a mindset of a single, single person. So that was my kind of like aha moment. Um, and I guess the way out of that for me, this is the way I'm intellectualizing it at the moment is get out of this, the environment that I'm in. By the way, this is only if I want that, like if I want marriage and kids, I think I would have a better chance if I got out of this environment that I'm in and put myself into an environment where family values and the visual cue of like couples with yeah. kids where it was more apparent. Would you agree with that, Peter? If you walk to work past 10 fast food restaurants versus you walk to work past 10 yoga studios and gyms, you're going to start making choices by being influenced at a different level. Right. Yeah, your environment is that strong. And yeah, we don't need to convince you uh, people of that. It's just yeah, basic human behavior and adaptability. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely 100%. The, the, the other challenge yeah, is that the second biggest influence over and above peer group that affects people's compass needle is the media. And unfortunately, so many people are sucked in and addicted to the media when they have absolutely no clue what the business model of the media is, what the purpose of the media is. They think it's to provide the news. I don't know. If you think the role of the media is to provide you the news, you're in Disneyland. Well, just as a caveat, uh, Peter, I was in the media for many years. So I was a newspaper reporter and then I was a, uh, 
a sports center anchor on ESPN, a sports journalist. I know how the, how the news you works. You tell me I'm wrong. Yeah. No, you're, no, no, you're not wrong. And in fact, I'm watching this. Uh, I was watching the news recently with the, the shooting in Orlando and I was watching the news on, you know, the whole Donald Trump and the whole Hillary Clinton thing. And I can see exactly what the news is doing, which is it's a business. It's trying to get eyeballs. It's trying to get you to watch. And it's, it's sensationalizing the news to keep you hooked because the human brain loves like danger and shocking um, things. And, and all, you watch that at local news channel, it's all like negativity, 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 yeah. negativity, because the human brain is designed to pay attention to negative negativity because back in the day, it was like, we have to always be aware and conscious. Correct. Otherwise a bear might come and come and eat us. So um, it's, it's stimulating a part of the brain called the amygdala. That's yeah, right. yeah. The, the, the amygdala, just as you said, notice is negative before positive. Uh, yes. And yeah, you walk past a tree, miss an apple, no big deal. Miss a snake, potentially big deal. So right. constantly scanning. And the amygdala has a VIP pass to the front of the queue to the reticular activating system, whose job is to sweep 99% of everything in your conscious and unconscious awareness under the carpet mm -hmm. and flag up what's important, which is why you hear your name across the street when you're in a different conversation you know, or at a party. Because it was listening to everything and, oh, no, that's not important. Sweep it under the carpet. Oh, that, my name, that's important. Flags it up. Well, the amygdala, which is a survival mechanism, gets to the front of the line with a red uh, ticket and says, let me in. So newspapers know this. They spend a lot of money paying good people, you know, smart people on, out of Harvard on Madison Avenue to go and stimulate your amygdala so that you can be recruited as a viewing statistic to justify rate card. That's just common knowledge. So what's, how do we, how do we digest our news then? What's the, so what's the, your recommendation, Peter? Probably the same as yours with alcohol. Give it up <laughs> for 30 days and see what happens. <laughs> I, I, like I haven't watched a newspaper report uh, or a CNN report, constant negative news. Yeah. Or yeah. Or, or read a newspaper or seen any news report for the best part of 15 years. I have absolutely no clue what's going on in the world according to what the media's agenda is. I have every clue what's going on in my world. And I'm very happy with that. And if something's important, it'll find me. Yeah, right. it's my belief. And yeah. you know, I'm international some, businesses and I don't need the, I don't need the media. Some so people, some people I, I actually had this very conversation with my mother back in Brisbane, Australia on the on a FaceTime call a couple of days ago, and I was she was crapping on about the Australian politics, and I'm like, Mum. Just stop reading it. Why do you even care? And she was she was actually shocked, and she didn't say the word, but I, I suspected that she thought that I that I was taking a very ignorant stance in terms of like trying to 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 shut out what's going on in the world. And I think that she was perplexed at the idea that I would just you know not pay attention to real what she perceived to be real important issues in the world. Oh my goodness! I mean, and again, yeah. Let, let me sum it up, and we could move on, but. You know, it's, here's a metaphor to help people understand, All right? People say, well, how do you know what's going on in the world? I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Everything's going on in the world. A better question is, what would you rather choose to focus on, on your terms? Imagine the Amazon rainforest at night. Now, what's going on? Everything. The media is going to take a flashlight for your attention and shine it on a part of that forest. Oh, look, here's a snake eating a frog. Yeah, well, guess what? On the other side of the forest, here's a beautiful hummingbird giving birth, you know? It's what do you want to choose to focus on? Everything is going on. And yeah, I get asked the question right now. Britain apparently is in this big referendum about Brexit and in and out of Europe. And I was speaking in Portugal yesterday and they said, oh, which way are you voting? I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't vote. I don't do politics. Uh, I have no interest whether Britain goes in or out of the, the euro because that's not my focus. My focus is totally on focusing, on concentrating on my awareness my life on creating the best me that I can be to serve as many people as I can without getting caught up and trading off, yeah, allowing awarenesses in that are going to make me wake up in the morning and think negative before positive. Sorry, that's, that's just where I'm at. We're talking to Peter Sage from his home in Leicester in the UK. He's a world-class speaker and executive coach. You can find him on Twitter at Peter Sage 7 All right, let's, uh, we might speed this up just a little bit. We're just about halfway. Uh, what's the fourth tip here on, on how to reinvent yourself, Peter? Raise your level of consciousness. Now, that may sound a little nebulous for many people because yeah, consciousness tends to fall into usually one of two different halves. Yeah, one is the uh, spiritual nebulous kind of esoteric you know, uh, yoga bunny, typical you know, sort of you know, connect with God and very unquantifiable. 
And then you've got the scientific biological imperative where it's nothing but a function of the brain. And it's very few people that are able to articulate it in a way where people can understand. So I want to try and share a model quickly that I think will help people. I want to say upgrade your level of consciousness. Einstein said it beautifully. He says, you cannot solve a problem at the same level of thinking that created the problem. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, I chunk consciousness into four different levels you know, on my basic you know, uh, uh, teaching. You know, I go into 17 levels on some of my advanced stuff, but you know, it can still be chunked into four groups. The first group is the, the level of to me, which is the level of victim mode. You know, I would have the life of my dreams, but you know what? Everything happens to me. It's level of victim where you're, you're constantly trying to blame everybody else, even though you can look in nature and blame doesn't work at any, any level. People that uh, are in to me and victim mode, yeah, you can predict where their life's going to be five years from now unless they get sick of it and get enough energy to motivate themselves into more the achiever mentality and progress the level of consciousness to what I call by me. You know, I realized that life is happening to me. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. If I'm going to go create the life I want, it's going to happen by me. And they go out and start hustling. They start and going, getting motivated and start going, you know, chasing goals and they start being able to move forward. That's raising a level of consciousness. Uh, so, so is it as simple as saying to yourself, life happens by me? Is that like one example of a sentence or I create my life or I create my movie? Or is it just when you say raise your level of consciousness, is it very much saying that you're responsible for whatever happens in life? Yeah. So, um, I'll just turn it off. So if we have a situation where you, know, you are predominantly victim mentality, the next level up is no longer being victim, but I'm going to carve out my own place in the world. I'm going to go and contribute something beyond myself uh, in order to yeah, add value to the world and therefore get something back for me. That's yeah, that horse trading level of relationship. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So raising your level of consciousness, which is saying life happens by me, you know, it's no longer feeling like a victim. It's carving your own place in the yeah. world. Now okay. that's, that's, that's one quick step up. You then go to, well, you know, I'm sick of swimming upstream trying to hit all my goals. Yeah. You, know, you make the next level up, which is life happens through me where you start getting into synchronicities, where you start getting into being able to understand reality is subject to influence based upon my relationship to my outer world. Um, you know, and through my inner world. So, yeah, how do you do that? You let go of the need for control and you replace it with a level of trust, faith, or knowingness that life is there to serve you rather than to fight you. That's a different shift in conceptual awareness. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, you know, I, I, I always say I'm responsible for my life. Like I know this logically and whatever happens, good or bad, I'm completely responsible for it. Um, it's funny when setbacks come, like you have a goal and you try to get it and you don't make it. It's amazing how fickle the human brain, the human mind can be. And then you go, oh man, I can't believe that happened. And then you don't understand because you go like, well, hang on, I create my own universe. I should be able to make anything happen. Why didn't that happen? And, and that's, the, that's the initial kind of phase. Now, again, I, can, I've, I guess I've done enough work where I can logically say, it's okay because setbacks are going to come along the way. And that is part of life flowing through you, right? Like you cannot, just because you say, I create my own life doesn't mean that you can create every single situation that you want, because like you pointed out before, the life is made, life is made up of you and everybody else in the world. You're still relying on all these other people, but how you perceive that you can control. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, understand that when you say, I want to create my life, it's usually the left brain speaking, which you know, operates in under the Newtonian paradigm of the fastest ray from A to B is a straight line. So we try to carve out a channel in life like a canal rather than understand that life is a non-linear process. The fastest way from A to B is not a straight line. If you doubt that, open your front door and try to walk to your local office, supermarket or gym in a straight line. That's not going to work. The fastest, most efficient way is to head on the, you know, down the road, turn left, head north onto the freeway to go south to pull up at the Walmart. Yeah, that's the fastest, most efficient. It's a non-linear process. You got some uh, good analogies there, Peter. I got to say, some very good analogies you're pulling out there. Thank you. Man. <laughs> but it's the river of life. The river of life constantly winds, and we freak out when we're heading downstream and the river's heading south because that's towards our goal. And all of a sudden, there's a bend and it heads east, and we freak out. We don't understand that if we had the ability to raise our awareness 500 yards above the, the river 
and still see that our destination is assured two kilometers downstream, we don't care if it goes left or right. We start to flow with the river rather than fight the current. Because what a lot of people do is they say, oh my God, it's turning left and that doesn't fit my pictures. I'll start dragging my, my kayak over the bank in a straight line because that's obviously the fastest way. Got me. Right? I, I gave up fighting reality a long time ago, James, for one simple reason. Uh, the damn thing kept winning. Right. <laughs> and then I get a lot of stress. We're talking to Peter Sage. You can find him at petersage.com. We're on the homeward stretch here. What's the fifth tip on seven ways to reinvent yourself, Peter? Understand what money is. So many people have a dysfunctional relationship with money and they wonder why they don't have enough of it in their life. In fact, the primary problem with most people is that they link their self-worth to their net worth, which is a fast track to nowhere. It's a fast track to being on a hamster wheel to poverty. And yeah, if you're constantly judging yourself by what's in your bank because society's conditioned you to do so, then I've got news for you. Uh, if, 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 you know, you were, if you're doing that, then you're constantly in fear reaction. There's no finish line. You understand you've got two bank accounts. We all do. Uh, one of them we were told about. It's called a financial bank account. But the other one's our emotional bank account. The problem comes when we feel that uh, we operate how most people do in life, which is that their financial bank account leads their emotional bank account. You know, I've got loads of money in the bank, I feel great. I've got no money in the bank, I feel lousy. What we weren't told, remember what I said, outer world follows inner world. If you want your financial bank account to go up, your emotional bank account has to go up first. It leads the financial bank account. Now, there's a time delay with that. We call it the quantum to Newtonian transition point, but it doesn't matter. A simple way of knowing it is that money is nothing more. Yeah, listen to me here, James. This is, if I could drill this into every kid before they start being programmed into thinking their self-worth and net worth are combined, I would, you know, we'd change the world with this. Yeah, money is nothing more than the perception of abundance triggered by gratitude and the actual money in your account is nothing more than a byproduct or a consequence of the value that you can add. That's what it is. It's a conceptual mind game. The only place in the universe money means anything is in the mind of a human. Nothing else keeps track of it. Or it's pieces of paper with dead people on it, yeah, shiny metal or hard rocks. That's about it. So if you can understand that it's the perception of abundance, what do I mean by that? Well, if I was to write a check out today for everybody listening here for a million dollars and put it in their account, many of them would probably feel more wealthy. But if Donald Trump or Sir Richard Branson was down to his last million, how do you think they'd feel? They'd be, they'd be depressed, I would imagine. <laughs> so it can't be the money. Yeah. It's not, it's not a universal like temperature. Yeah, you turn the room to 50 degrees, everybody's going to feel it the same. Yeah. I, no, money's conceptual. So that same million dollars can make you feel rich or nearly bankrupt de depending on your perception based on your association to abundance. Yeah. So if you understand that money happens when you give something of value, that's it. It's a, it's a measurement of value, but you've got to add value first. Otherwise, you're going to the gym saying, wow, look at all those weights. Uh, give, give me some strength, then I'll go lift them. See, that doesn't work. You're sitting in front of the fire at winter saying, I'm cold. Give me some heat. I'll go outside, fetch you some wood. That doesn't work. No, go and add value first and you'll look over your shoulder and think, wow, where did that money come from? Because the last time you ever got money was because you gave something for it first, either 40 hours a week in a service or a job or a product that added value to somebody. Yeah. Game on. And I like, I, and if you have a choice out of that, I mean, obviously you do whatever makes, makes you happy. But for me, I'm, I'm far happier making money with, um, you know, where I can actually see where I'm helping people. Like I, my two big value. Yeah. My three, I guess the, the podcast that I do adds value. Like this interview adds value and that gives me a level of satisfaction. Um, so I, again, it's not always some people who might be listening to this might be in a dead end, like what they perceive to be a dead end job that they don't like. But even if you want to practice giving value, why don't you just practice making your boss's job easier or practice over delivering in your job or practice trying to solve problems for someone like a colleague or a superior in your job. And you just watch what might happen is you get a raise or you get a promotion or you get considered for a managerial role or whatever. So always be thinking about how you can give value and then you will get value back in the terms of, of 
you know, of money, which- 100%. Yeah. You want the biggest tip for job security? Not that anything exists, but mm -hmm. if it did, do more than you paid for. Yeah. yeah and you're, yeah, you'll be the last one to get cut. And if your boss doesn't recognize the value, there's a lot of bosses that will. All right, we're on the last couple of tips here. What's number six, Peter? Check your identity. See, our identity governs virtually everything we do at an unconscious level. And 95% of what we do is based on habit, yeah, which is why you can drive to work on your day off. Um, and so, yeah, if you start to ask yourself, who am I? Because the labels that you wear after the words I am define you and what you do, which also includes the path you take and the limits you set on yourself. I'll give you an example. If, you know, why do vegetarians not eat meat? It's not because they have different teeth or a different digestive system, right? They may have many, many different moral reasons or you know, biological reasons for, for not wanting to eat meat. But ultimately, the reason they don't choose the filet mignon and they go for you know, the spinach ricotta is because their identity is, I am a vegetarian. Yeah? Why do smokers smoke? Because their identity is, I'm a smoker. Why do smokers who quit very rarely last out the quitting process? Because they didn't change their identity to a non-smoker they change it to, I am a smoker who's quit. Yeah, and so who are you? Because your labels limit you. And um, you take a health example. Let's say diabetes, a massive epidemic in the US and globally right now. If you accept the label, just because somebody in a perceived position of authority yeah, gave it to you saying, oh, you're diabetic. You're not a diabetic. If I'm a diabetic, where do I go with that? I can't. But if I understand that, yeah, I am suffering from a condition called diabetes, then I create a space between my identity and the condition, which allows me options to tackle the condition. Yeah. And, so, and you must see this with alcohol as well. Yeah, all the time. I mean, I also, just on a side note, I also think that the, or I tell people that the best way to quit smoking or quit drinking is not to say, I'm gonna quit drinking or I quit drinking or I quit smoking or I really wanna quit or I'm not gonna have a cigarette. I say, stop focusing on what you're not going to do and stop using the word, the very word that you're going to, that you're trying to quit, like smoking or drinking and start saying things like, I only breathe in fresh air. I only drink liquids that are healthy for me. Yeah. I, I only put fresh, pure air into my lungs. That way you're telling the mind what to do, which is a lot easier when, than telling the mind what not to do. Because which gives you energy. Exactly. Yeah. If, if I was a, a smoking company, I would put non-smoking signs everywhere, right? Because it focuses people on smoking. The brain doesn't process negation. It can't do. That's why parents listening to this, if you turn around and say, you know, you've got a little kid coming out of the kitchen holding their plate of you know, cornflakes or Cheerios or toast, and you say, don't drop that plate, boom, what happens? They <laughs> drop the plate, right? Why? Because the brain doesn't process negation. The Just kid that keeps holding that onto that plate. That's it. Hold the plate more tightly. Yeah. And you get a different result. Yeah. So, same principle. So check your idea. Who are you? Because ultimately, if you can come to the awareness that I am full stop, ultimately, that's it. Everything that comes after that is a choice. The challenge is most of us are wearing labels after that, that we've been given that we perceive and put on with super glue when they were only ever put on with Velcro. So just to sum up this point number six here, when you say check your identity, uh, essentially what you're saying is decide who you are and, and, and live that and make sure it's whatever it is that whatever positive identity that you have about yourself. Choose it, but choose it consciously. Most of us don't. Most of us grow up wearing labels that are 10, 20 years too old. Yeah. And never serve us in the first place. I mean, if you were growing up with 20 year old clothes right now, people would look at you differently in the street. And yeah, certainly if you, know, you were 25 years old, right? So, you know, we outgrow identities and beliefs. It's about that constant reinventing who you are. For, and there's a difference. If you turn up and say, oh, I'm a healthy person versus I'm an athlete, you've got a different sense of self. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you choose your label, yeah, for me, yeah, I'm a divine and guided soul that acts as an open channel for God's wisdom, a powerful agent of positive change who is born to reveal the greatness in others. Now, when I own that here, Boom, I show up as somebody that's in service to be able to help other people. Whereas, oh, I'm a personal development coach. Yeah, no, choose your identity and make it empower you. And everybody has freedom of choice over that. Yeah, I love that. Okay. 
And now we're on to the final one, number seven. We're on to number seven of seven ways to reinvent yourself with Peter Sage. So what's the final way to do this, Peter? Give your gift. Yeah, every one of us has a gift to give. Now, that may be the fact that we've all had a, a story that's so traumatic that, you know, we feel that we're using it as a way to connect with others through sympathy or through connection with other people that got sad stories. And we, you know, you, you hear the term misery loves company. Well, I don't believe that. I think misery loves miserable company. Right? So if you focus on the fact that no matter what your story is, if I can, if I can give inspiration, hope, example, because you've got two ways to live your life in the movie of your life. You can get to the end of your movie and it can either be a warning or an example. Yeah, case closed. That's a binary choice. How do you make that choice? Another binary yeah, uh, equation, love or fear. Uh, everything you do, you're coming from love or you're coming from fear. It'll set the game up differently. And if you're coming from love, even the most traumatic stuff you've had in your life, you can be able to give that as a gift, as an example to others of somebody that can go and serve. You were, yeah, had atrocities in your childhood. Well, guess what? There's a lot of other people out there that have had the same kind of deal that don't know how to deal with it. You show up and use that as a way to empathize and connect so they trust you so you can redirect their focus on becoming you know, uh, somebody else of value and believing themselves again that they weren't you know, violated, but you know, whatever happened, happened, and now you can go inspire and help others with it. Boom, you've got a gift. Yeah? If you've got a, a, a thing for numbers yeah? and you can help somebody who is, doesn't have a thing for numbers feel smarter about themselves rather than the teacher criticizing them in class, give your gift. There's an expression, a uniqueness about who you are that when we don't focus on ourselves, but focus on what's great about us, reinvent ourselves past groups, stop making it about us, get into a better peer group, raise our level of consciousness, don't get tied up in our self-worth issues because we link it to our bank account, have an empowering identity. We can really start giving that gift to other people and then life takes on way new meaning and the outer world just happens to rearrange itself most of the time in a more empowering way. I see what you did there. You actually just reviewed all of the seven ways in one beautiful sentence, Peter, but I'm going to get you to do it again because I want it to really reinforce this. So seven ways to reinvent yourself with Peter Sage, well-known international and serial entrepreneur, author, philosopher, and teacher. Let's start with uh, number one, which was swimming in goop. Just, just roll through them really quickly. Peter? Absolutely. And each one of these on its own has an incredible impact on people's lives. You start stacking them one plus one will equal 11. Yeah, and so on. But the first one, get out of goop. Stop being driven by the good opinion of other people when the reality is they don't care enough about you to bother to give an opinion because they're too busy starring in their own movie wondering if you care about them. Yeah, number one. Number two, stop making it about you. Nature operates on two principles, growth and contribution. Yeah, and we start getting stressed and depressed when we start making it about us. And that's nothing but a, a rumble strip on the freeway to guide us into reminding ourselves that we're here to grow and add value. Three, upgrade your environment. You become who you hang with, case closed. And if you put your body in McDonald's or the gym, it doesn't care, it will constantly adapt. Yeah, you put yourself in a group of positive people, you will adapt, negative people, you will adapt. The mind is a compass needle, magnetize it in a more positive direction, and you cannot do that if you expose yourself on a constant basis to mainstream media. So cut it out. CNN, constant negative news. So. Number, uh, next one, number four, raise your level of consciousness. Nowhere in life is victim mode supported. Nowhere in life does blame work. Either get off your backside and start carving out your life because you're inspired to go out and do something with it because you want to get out of pain or you want to move forward to be inspired to, to leave a legacy or start understanding that life isn't about you and therefore, you know, don't take it so seriously. Uh, raise your level of consciousness. Outer world follows inner world. Next one, understand what money is. Money is nothing more than a byproduct or a consequence of adding value. It'll never be anything else. You don't have enough in your life in terms of money. Go check how much value you've added. And I don't mean, oh, I work really hard. No, how much value do you add? There's a reason Bill Gates has a bigger bank account than, than we do because he's added a lot more value to the world, love him or hate him. It is what it is. Check your identity. What labels are you wearing that unfortunately came in too early and we forgot to take off. Yeah. Oh, I'm never good enough. Oh, my teacher said I was, I wouldn't do business studies. Oh yeah. My, my brother said I couldn't sing, Well, whatever it may be, what labels are we wearing around that? Yeah. You know, I'm not a singer. I'm not clever. I'm not smart. I'm too fat. Yeah. I'm not good looking enough. Who wants me? No, choose your identity right? because nobody has the right to label you other than you game over. And finally, yeah. Give your gift. 
Yeah, that's my evening alarm for, for reminding my meditation. Mm -hmm. There we are. Uh, give your gift. Uh, know that you have a gift to give, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You look at the biology of how human beings are born, 400 million to one, and you show up. Why did you want to be here so badly? I promise you it's not to work 40 hours a week for someone you don't care about that doesn't respect or, or get you so that you can retire at 60, hopefully with some penance to be able to survive off a state pension. Uh -uh. Uh, you were born for greatness. And if you forgot that, no big deal. It's never too late to remember. There you go. Seven ways to reinvent yourself from Peter Sage. You can find him at petersage.com. Go ahead and send a tweet to him right now, which is Peter, at petersage007. Make sure you put me in there, at James Swanick, and say, hey, at James Swanick, really enjoyed your interview with at petersage007, or hey, petersage007, really enjoyed your interview with at James Swanick. Maybe just share, you know, what was the one point, the major point that you got out of that? I'm sure Peter would love to retweet you, as would I. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure you check him out also at petersage.com. Uh, where else can we find you, Peter? Anywhere else besides there? Uh, I have a YouTube channel, which has a ton of free content in, which really goes into detail on some of the points that we've spoke about here. I really try to add value. You know, obviously, I run programs around the world as well. It'd be great to see some people at the live events, but you know, I also know that yeah, everyone has choices. So that's why I try to put out as much as I can, including YouTube. So you know, go, go check out some of the stuff I've got. And if it really resonates, then yeah, come play with me in person. It'd be wonderful to shake your hand. What, what's your YouTube channel, Peter? Is it just Peter Sage? Peter Sage 007. Peter Sage 007. I love it. Well, Peter, this has been uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful time spent with you. Thank you so much for reminding me about certain things and actually bringing new things to me as well. I, re I really appreciate that. It's made me think about my own life and uh, some daily routines and how I perceive things going on. So thank you very much for bringing great value to me and for giving uh, great value to my listeners. James, it's been a real pleasure. You, you do so much good for so many people. It was you know, a, a really exciting opportunity for me to be able to come on and add a, a little thumbprint to that if I can, uh, and, and hopefully through your channel, be able to help inspire other people together as well. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you to you listening and watching, and I will catch you on the next one. See you. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do the same things over and over again? Why are we persuaded?